Greetings again today in the name of Jesus Christ, our wonderful Lord and Savior. Good to see you here in the auditorium in the Northside Baptist Church today. We welcome every one of you. May the Lord bless you. We welcome visitors with us today as well as our own members. And to you that's listening out in the radio listening audience, we most certainly appreciate you tuning in to the Northside Baptist Church Hour that's coming to you live right from the auditorium of the Northside Baptist Church here in Athens, Georgia. Now this is Preacher Edward speaking. We're hoping during this hour coming up we can be an inspiration to you. You in the radio listen audience, if you'll call a friend, have them to tune in to WNGC 95.5 on the FM dial, the big giant station in Athens, Georgia, and get this hour, I feel we can be an inspiration to them. Now today, if you have your Bible, I want you to turn to the book of Genesis, will you please? The book of Genesis chapter uh, 9. While you're turning there, I want to say that we have more than 200 of our cassette, ta cassette tape listed. We send you a list of 200 of our cassette tape. You write in request it. Now the message, the music, and the singing would be on cassette tape number 213, 213. If you want this particular tape, then just write in request tape 213. I'm speaking on the subject, the man that pitched a drunk and brought a curse on his family. That's tape number 213. Be glad to get it to you for a gift of $3. The gift is yours to help defray our radio expense. So we want you to pray for us and write to us. We work us together in getting out the gospel. My mailing address is Virgil Edwards, P.O. Box 501, Athens, Georgia, 30603 is the zip code number. And so you pray for me and write to me, and we appreciate it so very much. Now Genesis chapter 9, beginning with verse 20. And Noah began to be a husband, and he planted a vineyard. And he drank of the wine and was drunken, and he was uncovered within his tent. And Ham, the father of Canaan, saw the nakedness of his father, and told his two brethren without. And Shem and Jatheth took a garment, and laid upon their shoulders, and went backward, and covered the nakedness of their father. And their faces were backward, and they saw not their father's nakedness. And Noah awoke from his wine, and knew what his younger son had done unto him. And he said, Cursed be Canaan, a servant of servants shall he be unto his brethren. And he said, Blessed be the Lord God of Shem, and Canaan shall be his servant. God shall enlarge Jatheth, and his, he shall dwell in the tents of Shem, and Canaan shall be his servant. Now that scripture speaks for itself. Many times I have preached about this man Noah, but never dealt with it from the, a negative viewpoint, from the viewpoint of something that he did wrong. We always talked about things he did good. Now I want to mention some of those things he did good and well. But I want to remind you that after he did these things, he did something wrong. Now the purpose for this message is this. To let you see you're not immune to the attack of the devil in your old days or after you served God for a long period of time. This man was around 600 years old whenever he built the ark and then of course he lived some 300 after that uh, time. But the man did something wrong after he had done all the good. And that's the thing we need to be concerned about today. After we have done good, after we have served the Lord, maybe getting up in years to ripe old age, then think, well, we're going to sell on through and then we let down our guard and the devil comes in to hurt and to hinder. And that's exactly what happened to this man Noah. He did well. God chose him from all the people in the land. They had to start over again after the flood. And he was a great man, a great man of faith. And a man filled with the grace of God. And a man that was very obedient to the Lord. And a man God used. A man that set forth a good example. But after that he did something wrong. 
that caused the curse to come upon his descendants. And I want you to see that. The Bible said he planted a vineyard, and out of that vineyard he made some wine from the grapes of that vineyard, and then he got drunk on that wine. Now, when he pitched that drunk on the wine, he undressed himself. You know, when people get drunk, they hardly know what they're doing. And so he uh, uh, became drunken and there undressed himself there in the tent. And the Bible tells us what had happened. Now his son Ham went in and saw his father's nakedness. And there's more things happened there than we could uh, mention in a mixed audience. The Bible says he awoke from his drunkenness and saw what he, his son had done unto him. And then, of course, he's greatly disturbed. And then his other two sons went in and covered his nude body. Now, this man here faulted by the way, and it brought a curse upon the, the, the descendants of Ham, uh, that is, Canaan and his family, because of what he had done. Now, we're living today in somewhat of a drunken nation. Someone said about one out of every automobile you meet today, the driver is either drinking, been drinking, or under dope and taking dope and about half of the people you meet on the road have alcohol in their system now that's bad it's not getting any better just about every time you turn on a tv or listen to radio today you hear beer advertised and beer is being advertised like it's no more harm than drinking milk beloved that's a trick of satan drinking beer is very dangerous a lot of people today have become drunkards because they first started out drinking beer. Some have become drunkards because they started drinking in a, in a social way. And the first thing they realized, they were craving more and more. Now you can talk to the drunks today. They call them alcoholics if the Bible calls them drunkards. Now you can talk to the drunkards today and many of them will tell you they started out by drinking beer. And now you can hardly look at a commercial on TV or sometimes many times on radio without you see them talking about beer. And they use athletes and other popular people to do so. And young people growing up today have seen that so often and so many times. And it's always before their eyes till until it seems like there's no harm in it. But there is harm in it. You can get drunk on beer. Why do people drink this stuff? Anyway, they drink it to get a good feeling out of it. And as they continue to drink it and drink it, they can become somewhat drunken. And as they continue to do so, uh, then they begin to crave it. They can hardly make it without it. And they'll take money that they have to spend for food and clothing and money they should spend on their families. And the first thing they buy, they're going to buy some beer for the weekend. Now, you know I'm telling you the truth. And you know that's wrong. And we find this man Noah here, he was drinking wine and he drank too much wine and he became uh, drunk by doing so and disgraced his family because he undressed his body, lay nude there in the tent. He hardly knew what was going on. And he didn't realize that was going to happen when he first started drinking a little wine that day. Now this man was a giant for God in former days before this happened. And that shows you it doesn't matter how strong you may be in God, how long you have served the Lord, how often you witness for God, you're not immune to the attack of the devil, and the devil gets you to do something that will hurt greatly and maybe cause a curse upon your family. Chapter 11 and verse 7, he became a man of righteousness, which is by faith. This man was a saved man that become an heir of righteousness by faith in God. He believed what the Lord said. He believed in God. He believed in the coming Messiah. The Bible says in Genesis chapter 6 and verse 8, But Noah found grace in the eyes of the Lord. He was a man that lived in grace, found grace in God's sight, in God's eyes, and God blessed him. Thank God for marvelous grace. It's wonderful to live in the grace of God. In Ephesians chapter 2 and verse 8, he says, For by grace are you saved through faith, and not, not of yourselves, it is the gift of God. Now salvation is a gift of God. It is by grace through faith in the Lord Jesus Christ. Now here last week, I believe in the state of California, a false prophet well known over the nation and international norm uh, finally died. Thank God for that. He finally died. He was a false prophet, 93 years old. 
that had taught people that they had to keep the law and do various other things that denied that the virgin birth and rather denied the, uh, the fact that a man had to be born again, denied the Trinity, denied many of the fundamental doctrines in the Bible. And he lived, of course, to be 93 years old and sowed poison doctrine and his poison literature and his um, uh, television minister over this nation, his minister rather, and finally died at the age of 93. I thought he never would die, but he finally did and uh, went on into eternity. Now this man, of course, the nation is better off uh, by not having this false prophet alive in the land. Any time you have a false prophet to die, you hate for him to go to hell, but they determine that themselves, and they go to hell because they don't believe in the truth of the Bible, and they're not going to get saved. And any time a false prophet dies, then the, God's people are better off. So God's people are better off by the, the death of this false prophet that spread his uh, false doctrine over the nation for many, many, many years, even establishing a college and working out through that college, receiving multitudes of young people. But anyway, uh, we find that Noah found grace in the eyes of God. Now, this false prophet I just mentioned did not believe in the grace of God for salvation. Did not believe that at all. Therefore, he knew nothing about it anyway. Now, secondly, this man that pitched this drunk, one of God, one of God of things not seen as yet. Now, God said to him one day, he said, Now, Noah... I'm going to destroy the entire human race from off the face of the earth. The Bible says in Hebrews chapter 11 and verse 7, By faith Noah being warned of God are things not seen as yet. Now you may say, preacher, what did he mean by things not seen as yet? Well, God had never destroyed the earth with a flood like this as far as we know. And it hadn't rained upon the earth uh, before this particular time when God told Noah what he was about to do. And God warned Noah and said, Noah, I'm going to warn you of things not seen as yet. I'm sending a flood upon the earth to destroy all humanity from off of the face of the earth. And he said, Noah, I want you to build an ark, build a boat, and then I want you and your family to enter into that boat. Now you must remember, Noah had to build a boat on dry ground without any water to float it. And that boat was about five times the length of this church. And this church is 100 feet in length. And, and it was about, um, about as wide as this church is long and three stories high. Now he said, um, uh, Noah, I want you to build a huge boat out on dry land a long way from the sea. Now Noah started building a boat, mind you. It never rained upon the earth prior to this time. And he had to build that boat by faith, believing that God would float it. No doubt some of the people came and said, Now, hey, Mr. Noah, what are you doing? He said, I'm building a boat. Oh, uh, you mean something that uh, floats on water? Oh, yes. Something that the water will carry up and it'll float on the water. And they said, What do you mean, man? How are you going to get it to the ocean? He said, Never mind about that. I'm not going to take it to the ocean. God's going to send the water for the boat here. Well, they said, oh man, uh, you cracked in the head. We don't believe a word of that. But Noah, by faith, built that boat. He hammered away, and for 120 years, he and his three sons preached and worked on the boat. No doubt they were called uh, nuts and cranks and, and uh, uh, ignoramuses and everything to be thought of in that day. But they went ahead and built the boat anyway. God warned him of things to come. In Hebrews 11, 7, by faith, Noah being warned of God of things not seen as yet. And in Genesis chapter 2, verses 5 and 6, the Bible said, God had not caused it to rain upon the earth, but there went up a mist from the earth and watered the whole face of the earth. So it hadn't rained at the time he was in the boat building business. And he had to build it by faith, believing that God would furnish some water to float it. Now that was faith in God, believing what God said. This man believed God, had strong faith in God. He didn't have a complete Bible of prophecy in his day. Beloved, he had to walk with God and live for God back in a day when the believers were few in number. And of course, uh, God used him in a great way. And he warned him of things to come to pass as yet. Then number three, this man that pitched this drunk 
expected the judgment of God. Now, if he did not expect the judgment of God, he would never have built a place of safety. God said, my judgment is coming. Lord, do you believe that? Yes, sir. All right, if you believe my judgment is coming, I want you to do something about it. In Hebrews chapter 11 and verse 7, by faith Noah, being warned of God of things not seen as yet, moved with fear. Now the fear of God is the beginning of knowledge. Now this man moved with fear. God said, Noah, I'm sending my judgment upon the earth. My judgment is coming upon the earth, Noah. You better believe that. He said, yes, sir, I believe that. Now today, people preach their hearts out. They warn people about the judgment to come about the wrath of God to come and to laugh and go on their merry way, they don't believe a word of it. People in Noah's day didn't believe it either, but Noah did. And people they don't believe it, but you do. If you're a Christian, you believe in the judgment of God. And we do know that God is coming to lift out His people, the born-again believers, those in Christ, of course, to be taken out to meet Him in there, and God's judgment will come. It's coming up on this earth exactly like God said it would. God will pour out wrath upon this earth. The only thing today that's holding back the wrath of God are the born again believers that make up the body of Christ. You're holding back the wrath of God. You're the soul of the earth. You're the light of the world. And God will not send his wrath on the earth till he takes the salt away, moves the light out, it's left in his spiritual darkness. And then God's wrath is coming upon this earth. Now, do you believe that? I'm sure you do. Now, if I'm speaking to someone out in the radio listen to this, you don't believe in the wrath of God. You don't know Christ. You just sit around like that crowd did in Noah's day. And one of these days, it'll be too late. You'll be caught in the wrath of God. God's going to destroy sinners from the face of the earth. That time is coming. And so he preached about the judgment of God. He expected that to come. And it's good when people expect the judgment of God to come and believe that because it's coming. And the fear of God is the beginning of knowledge. Number four, this man built an ark to the saving of his own household. Now God said to Noah, Noah, I know you love your family. You have uh, three sons and they are married and you have three daughters-in-laws. You have a wife and I know you want them saved. I know you want them to escape the wrath of God. Now, let me nail down something here. Beloved, the man is responsible for his household. Not the woman, not the children, but the man himself. God is holding every man responsible for his household. If your children grow up and die without God and go to hell, you're going to be held responsible for it. You can't blame that on anyone else. I'm speaking to some of you lazy men out there in the radio listening audiences. Just now getting up out of bed and too lazy to get up and carry your children and wife to Sunday school and church. Did you know God's going to hold you responsible for your family? If your children die and go to hell, you're going to be responsible for it. If they grow up to be criminals and you never taught them the right way, the way of God, God's going to hold you responsible. You can't escape that. God plainly said in the Bible that that man is held responsible for his household and what goes on in his house. Regardless of whether his son to be seen or hurt or felt, whatever goes on in your house, if it's wrong, God is holding that man responsible for it. You can't blame it on your wife. You can't blame it on those children growing up in your home. God's going to hold you responsible. And as long as those children abide under your roof, eat your food, sleep on your bed, live in your house, you're responsible for them. Now, when they get out and get on their own and get married, they're responsible to God themselves, and God holds them responsible for their household. But as long as they're in your house, you are responsible. Now, you need to realize that after you've tried to win them to God, done the best you could, if they still die and go to hell, their blood won't be on your hands. But otherwise, it will be, and Noah was responsible for his family. God said, Noah, do you want to save your household? Hebrews chapter 11 and verse 7, By faith Noah, being warned of God of things not seen as yet, moved with fear, prepared an ark to the saving of his own house. The Bible says in 1 Peter chapter 3 and verse 20, In the days of Noah, while the ark was preparing, wherein few, that is, eight souls, were saved by water. 
That is, they were lifted up and saved from the wrath of God by the water that floated the boat. They were saved from the wrath of God, not their souls, but their lives, of course. In Acts chapter 16, verse 31, they said, Believe on the Lord Jesus Christ, and thou shalt be saved in thy house. We find the Philippian jailer believed on Jesus, and he and his whole household were saved. Had not that Philippian jailer gotten saved that day, his family might have gone to hell. Now, it never occur to you, I'm talking to you men now, if you would get right with God, it might be the means of your wife and your children getting saved and escaping hell. Have you ever thought about that? If you don't get right with God, did it ever occur to you that you may be responsible for them screaming and crying in the flames of hell someday and pointing their finger in your face and said, if you'd have been the right kind of daddy and told me about God, I wouldn't be in hell? Now, you can't escape that. You've got to face that. Every man is responsible for those children that grow up in his home. And so God holds him responsible. And so Noah built an ark to save his house. God said about Abraham and Joshua and the Hebrew fathers in Egypt, they're responsible and they were responsible and they did something about it. So God still holds them responsible today. We can't shake that off or excuse ourselves and get away with it. God knows. Then we come to the next thought and that is he built an ark, a beautiful ark, a huge boat there which was a type of Jesus Christ in his construction. In many ways it was a type of Christ. I'll touch on it because I don't have time to say too much about it. It was built by God's own divine plans and specifications. And God had it built to represent things to come, to be a type of things to come. It had only one way of entrance, the Bible says in Genesis 6, 16. That is, it only had one door through which the people could enter. And there's only one door in which you can enter heaven or get into the body of Christ. And that's through Jesus Christ. Jesus said, I am the door. By me, if any man enter in, he shall be saved. And so there's only one way to heaven. Somebody said, well, you know, we have different denominations and, and different ways and different religions. Each man goes his own way and, and we're all working for the same cause. Not a word of that so. The Bible said there's one faith, one Lord, one baptism. That's not different faith. You have different religions. There's one faith, one Lord, one baptism. Now, that's the faith that gets you to heaven. And so they have to go in through that one door. God said, Noah, put a door in the side of that ark, and they went in through that door, and they were safe on the inside. While Jesus, our door, hang on the cross, remember a Roman soldier stuck a spear in his side, and his blood was shed there, and out came blood and water there on the cross. And so this ark not only had one door, but it had three stories. Now the three stories represent the triune God. The Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. See, we have a trinity with which we're to do. That is, uh, the Father, Son, and the Holy Ghost. One God, substituting three distinct personalities. And so the three stories represent the triune God. Man's a trinity. You're looking here at a trinity, but you only see a body. I have a body, I have a soul, and I have a spirit. But you only see the body. We have one God subsisting in three distinct personalities. The Father, the Son, and the Holy Ghost. They had one boat, but in that boat they had three stories. And so they entered in through the door, and they were on the inside. I could say much today about the Trinity, but I will not. Man is a Trinity. He's saved by a Trinity. He's attacked by a Trinity. And you need to realize that. And I believe in the Trinity. You have people today that's false teachers and false prophets and some cults in the land that deny the Trinity. To deny the Trinity is to deny one of the major doctrines in the Bible. We don't know too much about it, but the Bible teaches it. We can't explain too much about it, but the Bible teaches it. There's many things I can't understand. I can't understand how through electricity we can get light and we can get air, we can get heat and so forth. I'm not going to sit here in the dark just because I can't understand electricity. You can take a black cow that gives a white milk and yellow butter and eats green grass, and I can't understand that, but I like the milk and butter, don't you? And because I can't understand that, then I'm not going to refuse to eat the butter and drink the milk and eat the beefsteaks just because I don't understand it. And so there's much said about the Trinity, and we're not trying to explain the Trinity. We're just telling you the Bible teaches a Trinity. The devil has a trinity, 
the beast, the false prophet, and the devil himself. And there's only three ways through which the devil attacks man, the lust of the flesh, lust of the pride of life. And then we go to another thought, and this ark had one window above. And I believe the window was finished above so that no one in his family could look up. The Bible says, I keep him in perfect peace, his mind is stayed on Christ. The Bible said, we to look unto him and be saved all the ends of the earth. The Bible said in James 1, 17, every good and perfect gift is from above and comes down the Father of light. And so the window is finished above. Now, God's people need to look up. Keep your eyes on things above. Whenever you begin to look around you and try to figure out circumstances and why this happened, why that happened, how to do, how to do that, You'll get depressed. When you get your eyes on human beings and they falter, you become depressed. God didn't say, keep your eyes on human beings. We're all sinners saved by the grace of God. God said, keep your eyes on the Lord. There's no fault in him. And so they had one window to look up. They had two birds in that ark. I could preach a sermon on it if I had the time. The raven and the dove. The raven is a type of the flesh. The dove is a type of the spirit of the inner man. You know, the believer has a divine nature imparted unto him the moment he's saved, and that gives him a dual nature. So that raven goes out and doesn't come back because it loved uh, the dead carcasses of the old world. The little dove went out and came back because it found no rest for the sole of its feet. That raven is type of the outer man, the dove the type of the inner man. Now that dove then went out the second time, it came back bringing a little olive branch. It went out the third time and didn't come back again. Now the first time that dove went out as a type of the Spirit of God coming up on the prophets of old in the Old Testament. The second time that dove went out and came back with olive branch is a type of the Spirit of God coming up on the head of Jesus when he was baptized in the river of Jordan when the Spirit came to form of a dove lighting up on the head of a new creation. He brought something new back. He brought back something new of a new creation as it were. When that dove went out the third time and did not come back anymore. That's a type of the Holy Spirit coming on the day of Pentecost to remain on this earth until God carries the church home. Now you see the dove in action three times here in the ark. And so the raven is a type of the flesh. The dove is a type of the, of the inner man of the Holy Spirit. And you have a constant battle because you have to do with the dove and the raven, the flesh and the spirit. There's a constant battle going on between the two and will do so as long as you live. In Galatians chapter 6 verse 16, then flesh, le the flesh less against the spirit, the spirit against the flesh. Read Romans 7. See what Paul ran into there uh, in, in regard to the, the old man in the battle between the spirit and the old man. And then again, we find that the ark being built condemned the world. In Hebrews chapter 11 verse 7, by which he condemned the world. Those people that came by and saw that ark in being built, that fixed them. When they refused to believe what Noah preached, when they refused to believe in the building of that ark, when they refused to believe in the word of God, that fixed them, that condemned them. Now when sinners refused to believe the message, refused to get saved, refused to come to know God, and turn down the gospel, reject God, reject the Bible, then that winds them up. If they die like that, they go into hell. The Bible says in 1 Peter chapter 3 and verse 20, when once the long suffering of God waited in the days of Noah. Long suffering of God. For 120 years, God's man preached and built. And God was long suffering. But those people refused to get right and they drowned. God today is long suffering. The Bible said, as it was in the days of Noah, so shall it be in the days of the coming of the Son of Man. God is long-suffering today. He's wanting sinners to come on in and get saved. But those that don't do it will die without God or be caught in the terrible wrath and judgment of God Almighty whenever the church is lifted. Now the gospel is saved of life unto life and death unto death. Then finally, we find the ark was uh, for the safety of Noah's family. Safety. Your family is not saved unless they're in Christ. You need to realize that when you lie down to sleep at night, your children that reach age of accountability are not safe unless they're in Christ. Your house burns up, a storm comes, tornado, something happens, they die, then they die without God. They're not safe. How can we rest unless we know our children are safe 
in Christ. We need to be concerned about that. In Genesis chapter 7 and verse 16, they went in and went in male and female, all flesh as God had commanded him, and the Lord shut them in. And so God invited them in, and God shut the door, and Noah built that ark for the safety of his own family. And his family went in, and they were saved. Now Noah built that boat. It's up to every man to build a boat as it were for his family. And if he don't do it, if Noah had to build that boat, him and his whole family drowned. Now it's up to that dad to build a boat, as it were, for his family. And if he don't do it and they die and go to hell, God's going to hold him responsible. Back during the days when the communists took over North Korea, they rounded up the Christian people and drove them into a little church there. And then there was a picture of what some call the picture of Jesus today hanging on the wall. And those communist soldiers came and put that picture on the floor and said, if you will come and spit on that picture, renounce your faith in Jesus Christ, you can go free. Several of them did that through fear. But one little teenage girl came down and she refused to spit on that picture. And they took her on the outside. And they heard the shots as a bullet went through her little body. And there she fell dead, went on to be with God. Dear people, what are you going to do when real testing comes? Noah lived to be 900 years old approximately. There, there he had to build the ark and lived in the world a long time. And then all of a sudden he gets drunk and brings a curse upon his descendants. God put a curse on the descendants of Ham, his son that saw him naked. And they became a servant of servants unto their brethren. A curse fell upon them because of what Noah did by pitching that drunk. And there is what happened to him while he was naked in his tent. God help us today to realize we're not immune from the attack of the devil. I don't care how old we become, how long we serve God. We still have to keep up our guard or else we're in trouble. Thank you. You've listened well today. Let us all stand to our feet. Our Father, I pray today that you bless the message, that you'll use it, that you speak to hearts. Not only our Father here in the church, but speak to hearts out in the radio listening audience. I pray in Jesus' holy and lovely name. Amen. Deb is going to play for us on the organ. As she plays, if you're here unsaved, backslidden, or you want to come back to God, want to join this church, or for any reason God is speaking to you, you want to come forward, I want you to come while she plays. join the church you want to come back to God for any reason that God is prompting you to come would you come waiting just another moment